Hey guys, what's up? It is week 289, question mark. And, uh, you know, let's hop right into the reviews. The first one up is from Arrow Video, and this is the Nico, Naka, uh, Nico Mascarakis. Oh, I haven't said that name in a long time. But uh, Greek director, Nightmare at Noon. This is uh, from 1988. It has a really fun, like, kind of, like, I don't want to say B-movie cast, but it's definitely kind of that. You got George Kennedy. Um, love George Kennedy. It's got Brian James. It's got Bo Hopkins. And, of course, it's got the one and only Wings Hauser. So you got a lot of kind of, like, crazy crazy personalities on here uh you hear a lot of stories about brian james Wingshauser, and bo hopkins stuff like that um two of which you know are are three of these actors uh, are passed away um you know the only one still standing is wings hauser who would have guessed anyways uh this is a really fun movie and surprisingly this is one that i had not seen the entirety of if anybody's not familiar with nico makaraskis he's a greek director like i said and he's directed a handful of genre films and including uh what is it uh death blue eyes blue blue eye uh, arrow put that out i'm sorry not it's 100 familiar with that one but he uh island of death which was made the video nasties list it was his first directed film uh, pretty infamous movie. He did Hired to Kill, Zero Boys, the kind of action slasher hybrid that Arrow put out. So he's done a slew of films, Blind Date, uh, and he's a pretty solid director. The cool thing about Nico is he is pretty much loose tongue with all the stories that happen so he'll tell all the stories without biting any his tongue and holding back and he tells a lot of crazy stories and he always has these in-depth making ofs that he's made himself on the disc that are from the old omega dvds that used to be released uh so yeah anyways nightmare at noon let's get into the movie a little bit like i said um it has a really fun genre cast and you can just tell a lot of these guys are just chewing at the bit you know wings hauser is just completely bonkers oh he also did the wind which is a really cool movie with wings hauser as well so essentially what we have here is uh it's it's kind of like a remake of mutant which is really weird the bud cardos movie which it's not exactly like mutant but i believe mutant has uh wings hauser and bo hopkins in it as well from the uh mid 80s if i'm not mistaken and mutant is kind of the story about a small town being infected with something and a lot of people go crazy this is a, a story like the crazies from 1973 essentially there's a government official or rogue government official and Brian James, who plays a very creepy albino type character, and him and his goons kind of poison the water supply of this small, you know, desert town. Wingshauser and his wife are traveling through. They pick up Bo Hopkins, who's a hitchhiker, and George Kennedy and his daughter are kind of the sheriff and deputy kind of duo in here. So essentially what happens is the small town starts to freak out, uh, the first of which is an old kind of man that seems harmless at first, and he kind of loses it in a restaurant, which is a pretty cool scene. Um, Bo Hopkins and Wingshauser definitely play like kind of a buddy-buddy story here. It's kind of like a traveling, like kind of at odds, kind of weirdo, kind of like group paired up, you know, oddball group. And they have a lot of good back and forth. They argue with each other. They have some like kind of funny hijinks during the fight scenes, even when people are getting shot, you know yada 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 there's a nice uh amount of explosions that you would expect from a nico movie they don't skimp on the special effects he always is trying to do something bigger than his budget would you know let him and it always it, it's pretty successful you know i mean there's a helicopter chase scene there's cars exploding there's lots of stunts there's lots of shootouts it's never dull it's pretty fun um it's a story we've all seen um uh, but i don't think you've seen it exactly with bo hopkins and wings hazard wait Actually, you might have already seen it, but maybe you didn't see it in a desert town. I don't know. Uh, so, so that's what I'm saying. It's nothing exactly new, but it's a lot of fun. The Blu-ray looks fantastic. And if you're in like B movies that just have a lot of action and a lot of kind of like you know special effects, nothing like extreme gore, but there is some gore there here and there. Um, and and you like any of these actors in here, it's definitely worth checking out. You know, George Kennedy plays his typical kind of you know good-natured sheriff, kind of fair kind of guy. During the making of this, I guess his knee was acting up, but. Uh, According to Nico, he just toughed it out and just was a complete pro. It seemed like Nico had a lot of respect for George Kennedy. In fact, I've never, like, I, I remember meeting uh, Jeff Lieberman, director of Just Before Dawn, and I asked him how was George Kennedy. He said, super nice guy, you know, he's, he's easy to work with, you know. He kind of was, he said he was a little one-dimensional, but hey, I, I love George Kennedy. He didn't say that. He said that if you tell him to do something, uh, give him direction, he'll do it. The, each one exactly the same as whatever. But, you know, he wanted, a, I think he got a nominated for Academy Award if he didn't win it for Cool Hand Luke. He's a fantastic actor. He's good in this, like I said, and he didn't really stick his nose up to the horror genre. He didn't seem that thrilled to do it, but he said he understood how the market it worked and he was completely fine with it you know he's in one of my favorite films the dirty dozen but half of my favorite actors ever end up being in the dirty dozen so you know this is a really fun film 
lots of good special effects I mean, as far as like uh, stunts and things are concerned. And Bo Hopkins is just a wild man from the wild bunch you know I, I always enjoyed him and his antics in this one are really fun uh he's just kind of like this tough law man that's been kind of you know excommunicated from his you know his job and everything but you know he was in the right because he killed a rapist um there's an old like uh making of on here where they have interviews with him and bill hopkins is talking about his character and just kind of goes off the cuff a little bit that's fun um and again there's the films of nico makaraskis nightmare at noon featured on the making of the film with commentary from director nico and that's like four parts there's four parts of these are on like a bunch of the you know uh disc and this is kind of an old one and then we have behind the scenes footage original on center interviews with Bo actress wings hauser bo hopkins kim Lori beck george kennedy and brian james and we also have music from hans zimmer and stanley myers hans zimmer obviously went on to do huge movies he's a you know classic composer but anyways this is a lot of fun i can't see that many people not enjoying it if you're into like action shellac that uh is above you know its budget grade and does a successful job very fun movie Okay, the next one up is another Arrow Films release, and this is from 2022 as well. And this is uh, by Eric Pennykoff, and uh, this is The Leech. And this is a movie, uh, he did a movie called Sadistic Intentions, which I did not get to check out, which starred Jeremy Gardner, who's in this film. But also in this movie is uh, Graham Skipper. So it's, it's kind of like a four, piece, four actors in here. You got Jeremy Gardner, Graham Skipper, and I want to get the actress's name right, uh, Ta uh, Taylor Gardner, who I believe is actually married to Jeremy Gardner. So um, I didn't know what to expect on this one, and right when I popped it in, I was like, I think I'm in for a treat. I think I'm in for, I don't want to say Hidden Gems since it's brand new, but I think I'm in for one that uh, I think is going to get some buzz and some recognition, maybe make some year-end lists, because I really enjoyed this. This is exactly what you do with a low-budget kind of film. Um, and, you know, when you compare it to some of the other ones that came out, like The Righteous, which is another film that tackles some of the same issues, but in a completely serious and different way, I think it makes a nice counterpiece with this. Although I prefer The Leech. It's more my style. So, um, anyways, I've watched Jeremy Gardner and Graham Skipper act for a, a long time. You know, since I've seen Graham Skipper in Almost Human and Jeremy Gardner in The Battery, I've seen these guys come up in a lot of independent films and, and get some bigger roles and everything like that. And I must say, um, every time I see them, I like them more. Um, every time they do a different role and I just, and especially Graham Skipper, because I always thought Jeremy Gardner was great. I always loved him, but Graham Skipper was an actor that I thought, Oh, he, he's all right. But the more and more he just gets excellent and he's just, he was always good, but now he's just fucking fantastic. I love him in this movie. I think his character has a lot of depth. I think the way he performs it is dead on perfect. So we have here is, um, a priest, I would, a father in Graham Skipper and it's around Christmas. It's approaching the holiday and he does, he has this beautiful church. He writes these sermons uh, that um, everybody should listen to, I guess, according to him. But you know what? Really, nobody ever comes to his church. Three or four people. He has Rigo, who's a young man that kind of follows him and, and helps him out with the church and everything and makes music. And, and that's pretty much it. Um, he pays, he posts all these things on Facebook, um, touching certain subjects that could be touchy nowadays, especially. And he gets one like every time. He's just screaming into the abyss, essentially. One day, Jeremy Gardner is sleeping on one of the pews and he has no place to go and right off the bat you can tell jeremy gardner is a, is a grifter you know he's a leech is he the leech and there's a great little featurette in here that explores all this and they talk about who is the leech and all this and they go in depth i thought that was a great um you know addition to this film and it added context and it compared to other films and talked about it, it was a really good featurette i'm gonna uh, shout out what that is right now before i absolutely for forget preaching to the void a brand new video essay exploring the leech and Pennycoff's earlier films by critic Anton Biddle. That is a great featurette. Um, and there's also The Voice of Reason, a brand new video interview with Pennycoff and actor Graham Skipper, introduction and Q&A for Films International premiere at Fright Fest 2022, exclusive introductions filmed by Pennycoff and Skipper, the making of Leech, behind the scenes footage from the film set, Rigo's music video, Unfortunate, The Pod and the Phase th th 2, three early short films by Pennycoff. And then we also have, you know, uh, a couple commentaries on here. So we have a 5.1 mix, which is well used. Like I said, this is a very dark, dark comedy. Um, and it's a Christmas oriented horror film. So like I said, like we have these characters kind of meeting and as, uh, Jeremy Gardner invades, you know, Graham Skipper's hospitality and takes advantage of him. Uh, we start to see a darker side to Graham Skipper and, you know, Jeremy Gardner's wife or girlfriend eventually moves in with them. So now we have this weird kind of love triangle somewhat and this kind of almost, you know, them kind of mingling into each other in a certain way, you know, while he's preaching to them because he's essentially alone, doesn't have any to preach to and while they're kind of 
bringing in these out these these a uh, you know subconscious and repressed feelings that he has and then this idea that he ha- might have had some substance abuse issues but anyways graham skipper graham skipper in here his his face his demeanor and how he switches is just perfect um i just love how he holds himself in here i think it's perfect i think it's very realistic now jeremy gardner gets to be a little bit more over the top if you ask me he's a little bit more silly but he he fits too and he, he somehow grounds it enough him and his wife both grounded enough where they're they're very like this kind of trashy couple but they're funny and there's a couple moments in here these lines that dropped where i laughed out loud hysterically i have a very dark sense of humor and they just won me over where i was hysterically laughing and i don't want to spoil any of the moments or the reveals or anything like that um but it involves you know a collar you know a priest collar which i was like oh my god i can't believe they did that but it, it just fits in perfectly and it fits in with the way that you know greb skipper was talking about certain aspects of you know religion and what he believes in playing into the end it's really well done and I think it's great, and I think it's vastly entertaining, and I think, I hope, I hope that this one gets a lot of recognition and a lot of traction because they deserve it. And I'll go back and I'll check out the director's first film, and I think I'll enjoy this. But this is a, you know, I don't want to say it, it's, it's very, you know, isolated to a certain extent. It's not super isolated, but it, it's not like a huge movie. You know, it's very low budget. It seems very personal. It's, it's only got four actors really in the entire thing, and it works really well. It's the leech, you know, and most of the contemporary movies that Arrow picks are at least interesting. I've never seen a pick one that was complete crap and sometimes they're really good films so i keep out for the arrow contemporary stuff i'm sure it's on their streaming service if you want to give it a chance before you buy it but i would recommend picking it up it's definitely a contender for my top 10 so far this year okay this next one is from ronin flicks and i thought this was kind of cool they're doing a newer film and this is becky and uh becky was a movie that um i was really iffy on the first time i watched it honestly um and i i was a little harsh on it I just felt like it didn't go far enough for what it is. Let me get into the plot of this. Essentially, what we have here is these four escaped kind of uh, neo-Nazis end up taking refuge in this house that they're looking for a certain, you know, thing that's very important to them that is kind of a MacGuffin kind of thing. It's led by Kevin James, but what they don't expect is to run into Lulu Wilson, who is kind of an alienated teenage girl that just lost her mother. She's very upset with her father. It played, um, geez, what is this actor's name? He was in Talk Soup. Uh, uh, Joel, Joel something, I can't think of it right now, but uh, essentially she's very, you know, alienated and I, she's very disheveled and everything and she seems to have a little bit more of your of your violent streak than your typical teenage girl because of the loss of her mother and, and a lot of other things and maybe it's just the way she is so so we have all that going on while these neo-nazis invade her house and we kind of have you know I, it, it plays out a lot like a rape revenge movie even some of the same beats and the kills are like that but there is no rape but there is most certainly a revenge aspect to the film um the not neo-nazis are all solid actors the kind of main goon besides Kevin James is Kurgan, the Kurgan from wrestling back in the day, and he's pretty solid in it. He's very big, he's very imposing, he's very scary. And they kind of, uh, I'd say he probably has the most character development besides James and Lulu Wilson. They get into his head, you kind of fear where he is, and you know, he's kind of a well-established character as in that kind of in that kind of realm. So, basically, it's a lot of a chase movie, a lot of, you know, cat and mouse stuff here, but I, I knew what to expect more, and this time I really enjoyed it, and I did not know what to expect you know the special edition of blu-ray with the making of and watching the making of and seeing the interviews with the filmmakers and stuff it helped a little bit but just in terms of kind of knowing what to expect helped me a bit i i used to watching a lot of you know hardcore revenge films like fight for your life which has a very similar plot to this except fight for your life is like the ultimate exploitation sicky and and just i'm used to the more kind of really rough around the edge villain types you know there is the types like patrick stewart from green room which hold themselves i don't even want to say class because they're Nazis and they're trash, but they hold themselves to a certain standard, I guess, when they, they want to think like they're better than everyone, even though they're complete shit. Um, I'm used to more of the types like a David Hess or, you know, William Sanderson for Fight for Your Life, where they're in your face, they're just trash, 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 and they do such an excellent job at it that I kind of lean more towards that kind of performance. So when I saw Kevin James come in and, and he was very kind of I don't want to say reserved because there's moments of his anger. I was just a little let down because I do like Kevin James. I know people, he's a comedian idea. Some people would hold him up and whatever. Kevin James is not, you know, the movies he's in. 
all the time. You know, he's in a lot of comedy films, and I, I don't mind Kevin James. I'm not going to sit here. I didn't watch The Zookeeper or anything, but I'm not going to sit here and stick up my nose to King of Queens. I, I watch the show here and there, and you know, every time he pops up, you know, Hubie, Hubie Halloween. I just, he seems like an all right guy. I like his movies. Maybe that's what he's going for. I know whatever lowest common denominator, Kevin James, or whatever you want to say. But anyways, I enjoy him, and I think he's a solid actor, and I thought he was good in this. Rewatching it, I was like, I was just, I wanted something else. I expected something else. I expected the movie to push the limits a little bit more, and it's not that. It's not that. It's more of an approachable for a, a, a you know younger audience than you would expect, although it's gory and mean-spirited in certain aspects. But Kevin James does exactly what he's supposed to do. He just I just want to see him completely lose it. He's good in it. He's solid in it. I actually enjoyed him. He's very uh, he's got a lot of charisma for a villain. You know, think Stacy Keach or something from American History X. If you're thinking trash Nazis that can actually hold uh, have more of a sentence. But he, he kind of approaches it as a lightweight Vern Schillinger from Oz. Um, J.K. Simmons role. Uh, yeah, so Lulu Wilson's really solid in it, and you can see moments of her turning, you know, from, you know, from taking that step further into her, you know, kind of psyche of, of violence, and, uh, they address that really well. I mean, what happens when a group of monsters attack another person that, you know, has a lot of psychological problems that could very well become one themselves? So that's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, there's booby traps, people compare it to Home Alone. Um, the kills are solid, they're fun. They did add some CGI splatter here and there, which I don't think is needed because the kills alone are decent. There's definitely one shout out to Ice Spin on Your Grave. Uh, yeah, and, and they do kill. I, I, I shouldn't say this is more family friendly because kids die in it. There's a lot of, there's, some, there's a lot of stuff suggested that would scare people and kids and everything like that oh uh, the blue air look good the surround sound is good i like the score i like the style of the credits they're very very nice like cartoonish kind of deal stuff on here so like it has a unique feel it's got a weird mixture you know it's like brutal at the same time but it has a really bright color palette which i enjoy um as far as the special features are concerned we have film introductions from directors jonathan millet and carrie uh mernon and that's very short stuff like a minute 30 seconds two heads are better than one directing becky that's like a 45 minute uh making of no laughing matter with joel McHale, the fight of her life with lulu wilson fan art behind the scenes photo galleries auto commentary with actress lulu wilson screenwriters ruckus and lane sky and reversible sleeve as well so it's a nice deluxe edition of a movie that i was a little harsh on and i was wrong maybe i was in a bad mood maybe i was tired of watching 2021 movies or 2020 movies whichever year this came out in you know sometimes you watch uh 2020 you watch 10 15 20 movies in a row that from the same year you get burnt out um yeah this is a good film it's enjoyable, it's entertaining, and it's approachable for a lot of different people. Nice Blu-ray release. Would recommend checking out Becky from Ronin Flicks. Okay, we're going to be a little bit brief with these Umberto Lenzi flicks because we're going to be covering them on 22 Shots Italian Horror Month. Now, we had to push it back because we had some audio issues. Skype was acting up. The internet was being weird. But the first one up is 1975 from 88 Films. This is Eyeball by Umberto Lenzi. This is supposed to be a really wild movie. I'd heard it's, it's really sleazy, really ridiculous, and I can't say it's anything but that. So essentially what we have here is a group of tourists, and they're traveling, I think, in Barcelona, Spain, somewhere, Spain, I think so. So there's a, there's a group of them. Um, uh, they're all filled with a couple familiar, you know, character actors from Italian cinema that you'd recognize. And fairly quick, somebody's murdered um, and their eyeballs gouged out. It happens uh, a, a couple times right off the bat. Police officers enter the picture. They start to suspect people. But everybody wants to continue their vacation, which is absolutely bonkers and ridiculous. There is some moments of sleaze. You know, all the characters are not on the up and up. You can't really trust anyone. And the reveal is absolutely brilliant. I love it. Um, it it's a pretty solid giallo, but it definitely has, like, slasher flares to it that are a little grotesque. Um, it's not as gory as one would think for a movie where a killer gouges out eyeballs. I think that, you know, something like Headless Eyes is more gory, but also much, much worse worst film uh, pretty bad movie headless eyes it's like Hershey Gordon Lewis but worse um, maybe it's not that bad but maybe I'm just exaggerating on that poor movie so uh, yeah basically this movie is just kind of bonkers to be honest they compare it to American staples like Friday 13th but a lot of the style reminded me of the Fatal Vacation the Hong Kong film which came out years later where it's just like a group of people on vacation and they're all weird eccentric kind of character types and character actors and they all just start getting they get put in like more of a turmoil kidnapping situation where they have to fight back similar to Trauma's War but this one is just a slasher picking them off and of course you know people are suspected that possibly aren't red herrings all this kind of stuff a lot of red herrings everybody in here is a possible suspect and it really has a lot of the more um, slasher helpings than the Gialli and uh, I think this one's fun I think it's entertaining I think that most people will dig this one um, it was a Lindsay that I had not seen that's why I picked this one I picked the Lindsay films for the Italian Horror Month because there was uh, three or four Lindsay movies that I wanted to you know uh, correct for blind spots and Eyeball was one of them glad I got to watch it 1975 
five, same year as uh, Deep Red, which is insane if you compare how the differences, how they approach everything. Um, but yeah, Eyeball, it's good stuff. This uh, 88 Films release looked really good, solid, really, sounded really good. This is, you know, the deluxe edition. So uh, it's still, uh, I don't know if the deluxe edition's in print, but you can still pick it up. Following up Eyeball, we got Seven Bloodstained Orchids by Umberto Lenzi. This is the Code Red release. This is from 1972. And this is very similar um, to Eyeball, I would say, but more in the giallo sense. So what we have here is uh, uh, some girls start to get picked off. In the very beginning, it's really weird. Like, we have this old woman being murdered, and then, like, it looks at the, the killer, the point of view kind of looks at this picture of this girl, and then we go to that girl and she's like a prostitute she gets murdered and and then after that we kind of fall around a couple characters one of which is is suspected of doing it and we learn that the people being murdered are all off a list all off this list that was at a hotel and uh essentially we're trying to find the people uh, the the main characters are trying to clear the name find the people before the killer does of course they're not nearly as successful it leads us into all sorts of crazy places there's a few cops on their tail uh one of which was um g uh, pierre I can't think of this guy's name. I'm going to have to look it up again. I just, Pierre Pablo uh, Capanoni, who was just in last week's Blood and Diamonds as a main goon. He is the main police detective in this movie. He's really solid. I think this actor has been popping up a lot for me lately, and I think he's very good. Um, music's by Riz Ortolani. If I'm not mistaken, the score in here is reused in a, some, or it's reused before in some of the Carol Baker kind of uh, ones. If you guys know the Carol Baker Lindsay movies, I feel like there's one song in here or in uh, Eyeball that's been reused like three or four times in Lindsay films and it's a good song i know it's a good song but the score is great um the killer's motives in this one i thought were fantastic um i don't want to spoil it but uh one of the, the the killer in this has popped up in a bunch of movies i think that uh the audience would recognize them uh they're kind of a genre like a, a character that i've seen in a, a slew of movies a, a few from 1970 i'll leave it at that but i love the killer's reasoning and i it, it's it's batshit kind of like eyeball you're just both like these killers are so ridiculous and re and silly um the killings in here are solid um at the very end like it's kind of anticlimactic in the and the the final scene where you're like that's it that's that's what we're doing but it's perfectly fine not the not the ending but just the last like minute you're like that they're dead that's it but um yeah this one looked okay looks solid um of course uh who else is in this one antonio sabato yeah so like literally to me like um and uh marina malfati who is i believe she's in suspiria if I'm not mistaken, I believe she's the girl who says, uh, the, the girl with the very piercing blue eyes. Um, and is she not in um, Sister of Ursula? Correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, Seven Bloodstained Orchids, very enjoyable. Dug it. Glad I got to check it off the old Lindsay list. Okay, coming from Culture Shock, I popped this bad boy in just because Culture Shock always has some of the weirdest releases. And I realized on Internet Movie Database it said 89, but on Letterboxd it said 91. And this sucker had never been on my radar once. And this is uh, Devil Rider. Yeah, I've never really heard of this. It's a horror western. In the late 80s, early 90s, we had a bunch of these kind of horror westerns. We had Ghost Riders. We had Ghost Town. Um, so, so, like, we even had uh, Grim Prairie Tales. And what was the other one with uh, Bruce Dern from 1991? I can't think of what it's called. Um, Into the Badlands. So, like, there was these a lot of these horror westerns kind of going on. Um, I knew we had a couple in the 70s, which were less veered towards horror, like, I guess if you consider High Plains Drifter or Hot Snake or or um, Django the Bastard, they kind of have horror elements or the one where uh, the killer is kind of like killing everybody in the uh, bell tower and stuff like that, the, uh, the the gunslinger. So they have horror elements, but I wouldn't call them straight up horror movies. In the late 80s, early 90s, we literally got like horror westerns and Ghost Riders, Ghost Town, Devil Rider, like I said, into the Badlands. So we have this slew of kind of these this small subgenre that lasted a few years, and I'm sure everyone's and while it still pops up uh, with a movie here and there. But Devil Rider is definitely regional, definitely cheap, definitely low budget, but it is on film and uh, it is vastly entertaining. I will not say this is an amazing film. It seemed like a lot of it was ADR. A lot of the acting is patchy, but that could be directly, um, you know, the kind of writing, um, to be honest. It also reminded me of Dark Power, you know, uh, and Alien Outlaw, those kind of movies like that, those kind of low budget uh, 1985 movies that are similar, like kind of horror Western deals. But um, this one right here, I mean, I wouldn't even call those Westerns. They have a Western 
tinges in there or backstories or whatnot. These ones are straight up Western. So it's just weird. Like in the very beginning, we have your classic story of an outlaw who seems to be devil and he's killing a bunch of people, kills some prospectors um, and just waste everybody. He, they, they locals try to hang him. doesn't work. They shoot him. They, they hang him. They shoot him. It doesn't work. We fast forward a hundred years later and we have this guy who wants to open this dude ranch at this location. And it just like, it calls to him. Well, I need to open it here. His wife and his friends all go out with him. Some people with money. And they're like, why? So we have like a group of six people. They all meet up at this dude ranch. There's a owner there and his wife. And then this old man who knows the history of the devil rider. That's what they call the killer. The killer calls himself that. Of course, the devil rider can't die. So he's been riding around these parts, picking off people left and right, causing anarchy um, and murder and mayhem. So essentially what happens here is the devil rider shows up. He starts picking off all these ridiculously, mostly lame characters with hilarious dialogue. They pack in nudity here and there. They do it a few times. There's some sex scenes. Um, there's just some hilarious dialogue. Um, yeah, the Devil Rider is absolutely chewing the scenery. He's fucking ridiculous. And I think that the director and the lead actor and the Devil Rider are brothers. So, like, yeah, the, or family, for sure. They have the same last name. There's interviews with both of them on here. So, uh, anyways, it's just absolutely bonkers. A lot of shootouts. A lot of people just doing dumb things and then dying. And you're like, okay, whatever. The highlight to me is this old man who tells, like, the exposition dump about all them. He's like, yeah, the Devil Rider. And, like, he has this weird thing where he's like, I gotta beat him in a draw. Even though he knows how to kill him, he yet still tries to beat him in a draw because it stems back to his childhood trauma. I guess you'd say. But yeah, Devil Rider is this fun, cheap crap. Um, you could do much worse. It is like a slasher because he's picking them off here and there. Um, I'm surprised I never heard of this. I'm surprised that I never really heard anyone talk about this. So it's really kind of refreshing to see, you know, Culture Shock put this kind of stuff out. They also put out the Great American Scream, which I covered on here. They have uh, Girlfriend from Hell. They have some really fun titles, to be honest. And I, I pick up their entire line. Anything that they put out before, like, 1997, I just grab. Same thing with Saturn's Core. You know, I pick up all those because they put out a lot of interesting stuff. Not everyone's going to be a winner, but uh, there might be a winner here and there. But uh, anyways, yeah, Devil Rider. It's just a freaking blast. It it's cheap. It's it, Watch it with a group. Watch it with some friends. Don't watch it alone. I think this is a group movie. Um, as far as the special features are concerned, we have original VHS cut of Devil Rider presented in 1331. Behind the scenes footage, interviews with brother Rick Grote and Tag Grote, introduction by Bud Fleischer Jr. Um, I, I am sorry. I think that the directors, Bud Fleischer Jr. and the stars are the Grote brothers. I apologize. Um, this presentation was created by a 2K scan of the original camera negatives. Culture Shock is releasing his proud to premiere the fully uncut version of Devil Rider for its debut on day and it's region free which is awesome and it looks pretty good for a, a low budget movie shot on film i would recommend it um and you can watch the original version if you have any nostalgia for it but anyways devil rider recommended very fun cheap movie can be relatively quick with this next one and it is Jajo aka The Egg and it's a 1984 Polish film it's about 45 minutes long it was a TV film I had not heard much about it I just the cover struck me it's really weird looking has sort of some sort of like flying caterpillar cicada thing on it chicken bird I don't know what the hell it is so I was like okay what is this it's also Polish and right away it started to remind me of like the direct to video Japanese films from the 80s and early 90s like you know goes or Cyclops, just just in terms of its plot, but it doesn't really deliver on the goods like Gozu or Cyclops or any of those movies would. Those that burst of crazy special effects and violence and just insanity, surrealism. This one essentially follows the story of a scientist, so uh, a bunch of scientists, and there's this old man who's crazy, and he's a scientist, and he has these theories and these things, and he uh, basically has a person staying with him and a young scientist who's going to work with this like, world famous scientist and his wife. So essentially what happens is they run this incubator and he has this theory this world famous scientist that he can like reconstruct an entire body from a set of bones now he has uh you know and so basically a lot of this is talking and all this other thing and doing scientific experiments but there is some superstition in the background some of the side characters will say things that simply are not true or old wife's tales so you get this superstitious angle of course so you're having science meets superstition um there's a lot of nice shots while people walk through like the streets of poland you have a lot of this like fog and atmosphere and like, decent camera work which i enjoy enjoyed but for the most part it's very talkative and very you know experiments until the experiment goes crazy of course because we have somebody intervening and messing things up and we have
have this huge elaborate exposition what exactly happened it's not that elaborate it's not that long but it's an exposition dump kind of deal the backstory and what happens is the Jajo uh, or I call him the Jajo you know it means the egg the egg hatches and what it is is some sort of creature that you know uh, is ancient in certain ways it looks okay in certain aspects and it looks kind of cheap in other aspects but you know it, let's just say it has humanoids from the deep motives and we have that scene and it's strange that this was a TV 12 or something in, in Poland because this would not fly nowadays at all for TV 12. Um, unfortunately, there's some real animal cruelty. Um, so if you're very uh, sensitive to that, I wouldn't watch it. A, a lab mouse is killed on camera and in the kind of the very brutal way, just break its neck. I know it happens all the time in labs and everything like that, but it's it's still not pleasant to watch. So Jojo is interesting enough. The ending picks up and it ends very abruptly with some weird score, um, which is almost comical. And I don't know what the movie's kind of, it, it definitely, it's interesting and the fact that it's Polish and it mixes these experiments and the superstition and science is kind of mixing. I enjoyed that, the ancient culture, whatever. But uh, it's just okay. Uh, not horrible, not the best thing ever. So, I mean, I would recommend it if you're interested in this kind of stuff. You could, you could do worse in 40 minutes, I guess. Okay, the next up is a 2022 movie, and this is Resurrection, and this stars Rebecca Hall. Um, you guys might know who Rebecca Hall is from last year's Night House, the uh, David Bruckner movie. She did, she was fantastic in that movie, amazing performance, and you know what? She, she's definitely, uh, you know, it's like move move to the side, Tony Collette. We got a new person coming in. Tony Collette's amazing, right? But, I mean, Rebecca Hall is doing a great job. Two movies, two great performances back-to-back. -back. I'm sure she's done a slew of others. But I just like her look. I like her, you know, performances, how, how well she gets into the roles and how vulnerable and just she she seems and just how real and like a lot of trauma and depression and and all that kind of stuff so essentially what we have here is rebecca hall is a single mother she's raising her daughter her daughter's about to move to college and all of a sudden she just starts to draw again she's like i'm drawing again i used to draw all the time as a kid so it's like something triggers in her and then one day she sees somebody from her past or she thinks it's from her past and it's tim roth classic actor right Reservoir Dogs, you know, Little Odessa, a million movies, okay? So sees Tim Roth, and she starts to think, this this is the person from my past that did a lot of damage to me, and I don't want him around. I don't want him around my daughter. She confronts him, and he, he doesn't seem to know who she is. And this is kind of where this weird cat and mouse thing starts to play out, where, you know, you don't really know how much she's starting to slip from reality or how much people are affecting her, actually, you know, gaslighting her or whatever. And, and that's kind of the deal here. So um, the daughter and other people, you know, her lover... Um, um, basically start to question her sanity while you question her sanity and you're more you kind of put into these backstory of what happened between her and the Tim Roth character and it's absolutely brutal and there's a moment where she gives this giant monologue to one of her younger co-workers that she's training and it's in a dark uh, after she's already had the kind of breakdown or people think she's had the breakdown and she gives this long elaborate kind of thing about the backstory and it just focuses on her for the whole time and it's just a brilliant performance it's really twisted it's really messed up and it just kind of encompasses guilt that somebody would have it's a really good scene so as the movie progresses it gets weirder and wilder and you could definitely break it down and start to write things about you know uh you could do a lot of college papers on it nowadays for sure you know uh and i think that a lot of people could use this as an example for you know awful treatment of people and whatnot uh the acting's fantastic uh the ending is kind of surreal and crazy and it leaves it open that you're like do it. I see what I thought I saw. Did this happen? Has it changed? Is it different? But uh, it does tackle some really messed up issues, including, you know, uh, I don't even want to say how to say it. Like it has like a birth and, and, and kidnapping of a child and all sorts of stuff that's just really twisted. And uh, it, it it's an hour and 44 minutes, but I don't think the runtime really felt, it didn't feel like it was an hour and 44 minutes. I'm complaining all this whole year about movies being too long. And yes, they, they probably are too long, but an hour and 44 is a little too long. But I think for this one, it worked. Um, even though it doesn't feel like it, it's doing all that much, but it just, all the scenes are well shot. They're well acted. They're well constructed. And you're just waiting waiting to see the final scene so it really helps anyways the resurrected it is on or is it resurrection sorry it's resurrection if i'm not mistaken i better double check on this the resurrected is the dan o'bannon film i think this is just called resurrection let me double check it is called resurrection it's on shutter you can watch it i recommend checking it out it's good stuff would not be surprised if it made my top 10
Okay, the next one up is the Patreon pick, and this was I can't believe David Scott or David Luton. I can't. I think that's it, and it's the Great Beauty from 2013. It is an Italian film. This is a strange one. Um, I did not know much about it. Kind of went in blind, and I, I'm not don't really know much about the director or any of the people involved with the movie. You know, I'm not too familiar with later day Italian films or even European cinema like that from that part of the world. Just they, they don't make too many movies. Of course, Britain and France do, and Spain, but a lot of the countries still don't get. We don't get the big output that we used to from these countries. So. Anyways, the great beauty kind of follows this this critic. Um, he he's not even a critic. I say he interviews people. He wrote one book years ago. I guess it's kind of a mixed reviews for him. He's older. He just had his birthday party. He's about 65 or so, and he hangs around with a group of people that are all, you know, towards the twilight years. They're getting there. You know, they're just like middle age, but towards the end of the middle age, they're getting to be senior citizens. They are senior citizens, and they just kind of like hang out and drink and over party and and just live a young person's lifestyle. And we're introduced to all these kind of different characters around him and and he has relationships with people he and, and something kind of awakens in him when a past lover passes away and he kind of just has like this this look this this inner look inside himself about his life and what he wants to do with it and things he wants to change um visually there's some really beautiful moments of course you know it's filmed in a gorgeous location they have the end credits kind of show you a huge part of that location which is very welcomed um and there's some dark comedy of course i don't even say dark comedy just kind of slice of life characters saying things and and feeling real there's truth to it i guess especially i i don't know i'm not this age but it feels kind of true to it there's a lot of actors in here there's a lot of choreographed dancing with a lot of bunch of characters which is pretty well done like i have no real complaints about the film i think it's well acted i think it has a good message i think that it questions a lot and it makes you question a lot what you want out of life and who you are and all these kind of things as you get older um as far as like rewatchability i don't know if this one has any rewatchability for me that's kind of where i would come at down on it like i don't need to see this movie ever again if that makes sense it's it runtime's about two hours and 30 minutes and you do feel it a bit i would say so but but, uh, I mean, it's just like a slice of life diving into this character, him questioning and searching for beauty and things. Um, he has a, a sharp tongue, so that comes out here and there. There's lots of good dialogue between him, and his performance is very strong. And uh, it's an interesting film. I'm glad I watched it. No regrets. It's just not something that I typically would tackle. So here we are, and me kind of just discussing this and without much context as far as the actors or directors are concerned. But it's a great beauty. Check it out if it sounds like it's up your alley. Hey, guys. We're here for the Universal Horror, and this time it is Spanish Dragon. Dracula, as promised, the 1931 Spanish version of Dracula filmed on, at night on the same sets using pretty much all the same stuff except a new cast. Because apparently they couldn't speak Spanish. Bella goes to could barely speak English. Maybe speak Spanish better. And they probably were very tired. Um... They pulled the Jess Franco. So essentially, <laughs> essentially uh, what we have is the same movie, uh, same plot, everything, probably adapted from the same stage play and all that kind of stuff, except the runtime, instead of being 74 minutes, is 103 minutes, and it actually cuts out a scene here and there. Uh, the scene with Dracula walking in the streets, kind of like Jack the Ripper, is not here, one of the best scenes. And the cast is obviously different. Um, I know some people believe that the Spanish version is as good or superior than the original Dracula. And I have to say, I completely disagree. Um, I can't see anything they added, which would make the runtime so much longer, except that it seems almost like an assembly cut. There's a lot more air in the scene. Some people would call that atmosphere. I would call that padding. Um, I'm sorry, I'm coming harsh on Spanish Dracula because the I must have fell for the hype, uh, and that's my fault. But at the same time, I just thought it was a vastly inferior film to Dracula by Browning. I don't think it was as well directed. I don't think it was as well edited. I don't think it's as well made, period. I don't think it's as well acted. That's just how I feel. Dracula had magic. This is rehashed stuff. It's just not, it's the same, but it's just not. It doesn't have the magic for me. I I don't think that it's necessarily like a poor movie. Um, I do think that like it does have a longer runtime, and I think that they do pause on certain scenes. Um, but I think they don't there's more, anything. There's more atmosphere shots. Um, that stuff was good, right? Um, you know, more scenes of like, like traversal, and I think that characters like take longer to deliver their lines like like you know there's more like dramatic pause <laughs> attention and but it does really add to the pet like to the um to the runtime in a and detrimental I think, way yeah and and it may not be so bad if we didn't watch the exact I same agree. movie script for script you know the the prior week um if we had seen these you know months apart it, i think it'd be a different story um but 
with how good Dracula was that we saw last week to watch it done again in a language that we don't necessarily comprehend. It's kind of like, well, I just want to watch the ever Dracula. I mean, because, like, frankly, like, Bella, or, uh, yeah, Bella Lugosi and Van Helsing Van and Helsing, Dwight Fry were all amazing. Right, right. you know, they, they just really made that, like, such a, a treat. Um, while in this one, I, the Renfield characters, I think, just a little over the top, but not in, like, a good way. Not, like, uh, here, in the... Here's what we have here. We have a difference of acting styles from America, Americanized, or, or right. to Spanish. And it shows, big time, because... They're more of a stage play in Dracula, and I, I'm used to that. I like that. I can get behind that. Mm-hmm. I mean, <clears throat> we especially when we're coming from the silent films, we're we're used to that. We're kind of ling- moving into that, and when we come to Spanish Dracula, it feels a lot like you know stuff like from the Santo films or you know the Aztec mummy films. It has that um, Telemundo, the, very yeah. over the top. And I know some people said that they felt there was more passion in the performance here. I thought it was hokey. I thought it was over the top. I thought it was Grandpa coming at the camera like this, and I really thought that Dracula was terrible. He was really poor in it to me. I thought that his performance was garbage. I, 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 couldn't I don't really, know what he was doing. I couldn't get with the Dracula on this one. Um, Worst Dracula I've ever seen, I think, I don't besides know about... the one from um, Let's... Um, Van Helsing. There, there are a lot of bad Draculas. I, I feel. nobody's worse than uh, um, Richard Rock's whatever for Van Helsing is the worst Dracula I've ever seen. I, I do say that I, I did like this um, Van Helsing. I thought that he was he was solid. You know, he was solid. He, but I don't, I didn't like him as much as I liked um, in the American version. Yeah, I prefer him too. Um, but you know, he, it's. You know, when you're watching the American Dragula as Van Helsing, he's he's speaking in like the German accent, and therefore he's a really good foil, not only to Doctor Seward but to Dracula himself. Doctor from... Seward was pretty solid in the Spanish version. No, yeah, no complaints yeah. about Doctor Seward. About the same kind of level of performance. Same level of performance. And Juan was Juan. Um, was it Juan in this one, or it was, was it... Juan Harkin? We thought he was terrible. Is it Harkin? Harker. Harker. Yeah. Um, Read a million page book, can't remember the guy's name. That guy's that guy's name's embedded in my skull forever. <laughs> but they call him Juan in this one. Well, I always call him Mina Mia. <laughs> like I know who the characters Mina, are, yeah. but I'm like, I forget their damn names. I, but... I didn't hate this. It's not it's so hard to rate it because it's essentially the same movie, except it just has more air and I think some of the performances are much worse. There's some atmosphere that's there that's not in the original, but I felt this as a very tedious watch, and maybe we're doing the same damn thing we did with the Hammer movies when you watch four Hammer movies that share 90% of the same DNA back-to-back, and you know they're like, oh, well, the reptile is just like the Gorgon, but the Gorgon's a superior movie. It's the same script. So, like, is the reptile bad? No. It's just the Gorgon yeah. is better. Like, And this is what we're at here. <coughs> um, I'd give it three out of five. I, I mean, because I can't hate on it that bad. I just was disappointed, and I fell into the hype, and I just was probably, you know, probably just too much Dracula. Just too much Dracula. I, I mean, yeah, I would say three out of five is fair. It, it's probably a little bit better than that. Um, but just again, I, haters, I don't. I don't think we're necessarily being haters, but like it was a chore to watch. You know, it was. That's the first time this has happened. The man who laughs, I went. It was kind of a chore, even though I thought it was better. It's a good movie. Right. I just thought it was a little long. You, you know, it's just when you when you watch the same movie, the same script, the same sets, and everything, even under the same costumes. When you watch it the week prior, and now you're watching it again in a different language, an thirty minutes version. added on to it. it. I I wouldn't say that it's inferior. It's a different version. I was just confused by the runtime because it added nothing, like it, it maybe really like didn't... two or three atmosphere shots. Right. But there are scenes where people are just like. Like there's no there's air that needs to be cut out. It's not cut out right. It's not edited right. It, it's like there there is like more dramatic pause, and I, I think maybe they speak a bit slower. But like it all just kind of adds up to be like, can we just get to the next scene? And especially when you know what's going to happen, like when it is shot and how for fast shot. pace the Universal movies have, right. and, and you know they're supposed to be. You know everybody's like, oh, they're great because they're seventy to seventy five minutes. Boom, you're in and you're out. And this was not an in and out. This was like. A modern day horror film that just didn't have an editor. I, I mean, th- these were movies that played. You know, you, you pay five cents to get into the theater for every day, so you, you get you get your horror movie, you get your news, you get your, your cartoon. Yeah. You, you know, so it's like you know, let, let's go out and go to the next one. So when we get to these, it's like, why 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 are we 
making this, you know, a, a five hour oh, long epic. Before I forget, Murder by Clock, I think is next week. I think it's less of a horror, more of a thriller, and then I think Frankenstein's after that. So we're doing John Stanley's Creature Features, and it is in here. So, and it's very short. Four out of five, a Spanish language version of Todd Browning's Dracula with different cast but the same sets with the same costumes, lighting, and production values. George Melford directed, and some feel he did a good job, if not better, as Browning. Carlos Valeras plays Dracula, Lupita Tovar, Eduardo, oh, that's a tough one, Arizona Mena, Pablo Alvarez Rubio. Spanish is the, oh, sorry. Oh. James O'Neill, Tear on Tape. I'm not showing the book because I already have it open. They already know it. Okay. He gives this three out of four stars. Filmed that night on the same sets as the Lugosi version, this Spanish language adaptation is in some ways better with more fluid direction and scenes of horror and sensuality only hinted at in the Browning movie. Unfortunately, this long thought lost and recently rediscovered curiosity runs too long and Valerius totally lacks the charisma of Bela Lugosi, proving once and for all who the movie's definitive Count Dracula really is vampire james o'neill is usually dead on this guy is a hundred i didn't read that review i read hit i didn't read any of it before i read it but james o'neill is usually right i think he's i agree with him a lot you know i cheat and i always read the review before we watch the i just movie. dive in um well one it's because oh before they watch the movie before you no, no, before be, we record the before review. we record yeah, yeah like not just, before we watch the movie and it's only because like i need to be able to read something so i don't like stammer over my words when i'm reading it cold and then two because I don't remember what the fuck I watched the prior week, so it's like I better refresh. I better refresh. Like, oh yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. And then I just make the points that they make in the book. Um, no, sound, you don't. Yeah, I, I just, I, I just gave that review like word for word verbatim before Bullshit I read it out loud. Honest. You know, I don't even know why. I, read I the like book. reading the reviews after because <laughs> we can like discuss if we agree or disagree with them, so it adds a layer to it. Yeah, you know, or where they were at this time when this book was written. I agree with James O'Neill. Uh, I probably wouldn't be as high. He gives a seventy-five percent. I give it like a sixty percent, and that's that's a little rough. Uh, I'm probably just being kind of a no. It just it drug on and it drove me crazy. And if I sense something's dragging on, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I don't think it's an absolute horrible movie. I think obviously it's earned its place in history, and it's kind of a classic. But at the same time, I don't like it as the original. And the the superior version is the thirty one by Todd Browning. Okay, so the, the the chemistry between the characters in in the Browning one is I just it's too good. It's Bella just, Lagos. You know, but the thing, it's just too good that I just can't. And I really hated this Dracula. He just made, he was very comical. He was very Grandpa Munster ish. He like, was very cheap and like, he just was like, I fucking the camera and he just didn't do a very good job in general. And they didn't do the eye thing right with the lighting. Right. Yeah, um, so. You know, that, that scene between, um, uh, Van Helsing and, and Dracula the were like having the the battle. Well, oh, the that mirror, one later. But the battle of wills. Oh, with what the was eye. Van Helsing doing in that? He was like, oh. It, you know, it was weird. It was like it just it didn't have like the tension that. Um, it was really weirdly acting. I was surprised that that was actually when I really noticed how bad Dracula's performance was in that right. scene. Right, and and I would say that the mirror scene was I think a bit weaker in in, in the Spanish version because I, I I do feel like it's it's established more in in. in is it Browning? Yeah. In the Browning version, um, you know, there's more shots of the mirror, more shots of like Van Helsing, like kind of like inquisitive, like trying to figure out what's going on. And Bela Lugosi's like, he has like, like just like ire rage um, when he hits, it's the mirror while it seems um, the ever, Dra the Spanish Dracula, like he, he's more like startled by it as I, opposed to, you I know, feel, angry about I it. I always feel a Spanish Dracula's acting on a soap opera while Bela Lugosi's acting for the stage and the stage is better than a soap opera. Yeah, to a, to a point. This is soap opera Dracula. This well, is, I mean... Uh, House of Dark Shadows. Of yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I'm good, you? I'm good. So what's next week? Murder by Clock, I think. Murder something. by a Clock. Something like that. Yeah. It's 31. It's about a killer clock. It's about a killer clock, man. It's, it's a like Batman Amityville villain. 4. We're done. That's Amityville... Six, Six or five, depending how you put it. <laughs> it's about time. It's the one that's called by Tony Randall. I don't know. Some people don't count Amityville Curse as a as part five. I, I I don't know. Leave me alone. I don't know what's going on with the, the history of the Amityville fucking movies. None of them are real sequels, anyways. Apparently, you know, there's like five Parent Trap movies in like, like there's like twelve Home Alone. We're not bringing up Parent Trap. It's just so weird that there's like an extended universe of like the Parent Trap films. Like you know, 
And then they like should the cross. PTs, they should cross over CU, with another fucking yeah, shitty exactly. uh, franchise that shouldn't be a franchise. Like twins. No, like they twins. did with Evil Bong and Ginger Dead Man. Like we're crossing this shit over. Or I don't Anda- even know what those are. Or Anaconda and Lake Placid, and it, it's actually called Lake Placid versus Anaconda. It's like, bro, that's a lake. Like, how's a lake fighting a snake? You're drowning. You no, know what I'm saying. It's supposed to be the crocodile, <laughs> but they don't want to be like crocodile doesn't have a name, so it's Lake Placid versus Anaconda. Oh, we don't name the crocodile. I'm sure they do, but they're not gonna put that on the cover because no one remembers the crocodile's name. They might like. They well, what's the anaconda's name? He don't have a name. He's just anaconda. You know what anaconda is? You don't. The crocodile don't have a fucking name. The crocodile dies every movie. He's a new crocodile, if I'm not oh. mistaken. So it's like, is it the same? They'd be like, they'd be like calling Jaws the the place where he had what was it Amity Beach or something? I don't fucking remember where Jaws takes place. Obviously, I'm, I just lost my horror card. Um, but anyways, that'd be funny if you just called it like you know what I mean like. Wait, I have a question. Is it not the same Jaws in all the movies? No, really. He's a fucking shark. He dies. I don't know what's more ridiculous that it's a different shark this happening or is this like. I always thought it was like the same shark. Like, no, button like, four. Like orca. Button four. The shark has a hit list and he's picking off the the uh, the Brodies, the family that killed him in the first couple movies. And that shit. killed him in the. Yeah, yeah. So, it's the so same no, sh- it's not the same shark. They all die. So somehow it's like a weird thing. It's like and a- then there's a novelization of it that adds a voodoo curse in there. I was just going to say, it's probably yeah. like a blood curse yeah. or something. Yeah, the, you know, the novelization like- adds that. So it's like. It's like I mean, this movie's so fucking stupid. Why don't you just add it in the film, too? I mean, you know, like his blood seeps into the coral, and then, like, you know... We're done. Quarter. We're not reviewing the I, Jaws I am season. writing Jaws 15. Jaws 5 didn't really come out. It's Cruel Jaws by Bruno Mattei, a.k.a. Jaws 5. It's it's not, so I, I can't real. Jaws 6? I would just say Jaws 5. Did they ever remake Jaws? No. What is really? wrong with you with I, these questions? I just... I mean, I, they yes and no. I mean, Alligator, Grizzly, Piranha, us. No, <laughs> I want an actual remake Why? of Why? Why not? It's perfect. It's not perfect. We're done. Bye. All right, let's get in the questions, comments, concerns. Last week, I asked you your favorite Universal Horror film. So I'll be brief with a lot of these, because if it's going to be a lot of the rehash, I'll just kind of sum it up. Hudson, fave Gold, Oldie Goldie is Bride of Frankenstein. When I first seen it, I was obsessed with it. Still am. Bought posters, pictures. I was even going to buy the Waxwork album, and I haven't got a record player. Anything to do with Bride of Frankenstein. My only two cripes with it prob is the same as a million other people is the little people in the jam jars, and the bride was not in it long enough. P.S. Have you seen Gods and Monsters? Love that one, too. I have not. I will have to check it out. I agree that when I first saw the, uh, rewatched it uh, in recent years and saw the people in jars, I was like, I don't know. I don't know. But, hey. Uh, name the stars. Regarding favorite Universal film, that's an easy choice for me. It is and will always be the Family Opera of 1925. The Leroux novel, and I still feel 1925 movie is the most faithful adaptation of it. Beautiful narrative, beautiful visuals, and gorgeous score for me. It can't be touched. Travis Bickle, 131. Super proud of what Leone has created. Um, although it would have been nice for Headless to get similar notoriety. He's talking about Terrifier 2. I love Terrifier 2, and I've seen it three times in the theaters, but I still have a soft spot for what you guys accomplished with Headless. Cheers. Thank you. Joe McCadden. Guyver is my favorite anime. Love how you reviewed it. OVA is extremely hard to find. Yeah, I have uh, the uh, VHS, and I, I knew it was rare, but I didn't know how rare. Southport Rocker for uh, question of the week. Recall seeing Frankenstein at a very young age and has been etched in my mind ever since as a quality film with a great story. Don't go b- to it as much as I should. Have a real soft spot for Creature from Black Lagoon. Bill Peterson, hey Dave, did you know the house used for Ghost House is the same house from House by the Cemetery? I did not, but that is interesting to know and it does make sense. Ken Coakley, it's hard to pun put uh, put down one favorite Universal Horror film from the Golden Age. I would have to go with Bride of Frankenstein. Dr. Bertoris was eerie and laughable at the same time. The scene with the blind hermit was very touching and teaches us about judging people on the outside, but most of all, Elsa Lancaster as Mary Shelley in the beginning of the film was stunning beautiful then turned into another great performance as the bride to be honest i can't think of a universal horror film i don't like they had the right formula of darkness fog in this cemetery don coscarelli said that those were the most important things in a horror film and he proved that point by using those factors in phantasm which scared everyone in 1979 great film as well jp adrica way too hard of a choice but invisible man nick dam creature jason michael willard creature and wolfman steve radinsky creature uh, Kayla Lockridge, Fan of the Opera 25, Chad Warner, The Wolfman, Thomas Townsend, Gilman, Rodney Barnett, The Mummy, Brian Bar- Barry Kowalski, Creature, Scott Davis, uh, The Black Cat, Troy Howarth, The Old Dark House. Unless that doesn't count as a monster movie, I'm just thinking Universal Horror. If so, then Frankenstein. David Gare Jr., Invisible Man, Har- Humphreys, Invisible Man, Pete 
Forty uh, Second Street Pete, The Wolfman, Jillian Baker, Creature, Matthew Cantor, Creature, Jamal Potter, The Wolfman, Kevin Keegan, always really enjoyed it. Came from outer space. Um, Herbert West, all of them actually. Creature is my favorite. Goblin O'Reilly, Creature, 100%. Marcus Cook, Creature, the suit was way ahead of its time having to be Marcus Cook, the special effects artist. Um, Creature, the suit was way ahead of its time had having to be submerged underwater and not fall apart. Uh, Bobby Canepi Jr., dang, like everyone else, it's Creature. Uh, Bralado Romano, uh, Romero, Swamp Dude, he's got the gills and holes. Daniel Carson, Bride of Frankenstein, Ben Robertson, The Black Cat. And uh, he said, favorite horror movie, Black Cat, favorite monster movie the invisible man terence cover i'm not sure i can choose between bride creature or invisible man danny torkel invisible man or bride reese red bond uh creature and devil's daughter dracula's daughter sorry of course bill rodriguez frankenstein daryl spiel's creature jason limberg frankenstein uh joaquin montavala um or monta avon he says frankenstein uh darwin for uh, michael darwin frankenstein probably logan winton frankenstein meets the wolfman tom stein frankenstein watch it at least once a year thomas gleba creature or bride of frankenstein rebecca reinhardt creature jason patrick tough but invisible man rich rabbit bride of frankenstein ben Waz wasden creature robert barry franco's frankenstein Derek b son of frankenstein sean donahue the invisible man uh, man, <laughs> Jeffrey Vita Guerrero, Abbott Costello, Meet Frankenstein, Don't Judge. It's a comedy classic. No, it's one of the best for sure. Barry O'Connell, The Wolfman, Lee Bishop, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, Har uh, Heather Jarvis, Wolfman, Kari Sonnefeld, Dracula, Gabriel Juliet, The Invisible Man, Shajin Barbarian, Fuckenstein is my favorite, but The Ingisible Man and The Cummy are also great. But seriously, Frankenstein is my favorite of the movies, but Creature from Lagoon is my favorite of the monsters. Cab Rib, I think I'm going with the Visible Man too. Mood friend, mood, moods. I can't wait to read how many people answer this with Hammer Film Monsters. Haha, <laughs> we make a joke that a lot of people never read the questions; they just answer. Frankie Costello, Bride, Dan Chase, Invisible Man, Mike Clark, Frankenstein, Tyler Tadeo. I think Frankenstein is the best one, but for favorites, I got to go OG Troll, The Invisible Man, Money, Money, Money. Uh, Dylan Young, Son of Frankenstein, Kevin Sadler, Frankenstein, Alex Davincio, Frank, Matt Cloud, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, Leon. Halsey, the best is Bride of Frankenstein, first favorite fan of the opera, 25. Uh, Jeff Gardner, the Wolfman. Uh, Corella Waring, nothing beats Long Chaney's Wolfman. Mondo Ayala, Frankenstein. Jonathan Wilhelm, Creature. Belinda McKay, the Wolfman. Christopher Bickle, Abigail Stelmi, the Wolfman. Louis Taut, Creature. Hayden Hall, not to be basic, but I never tire. Dracula. Tim Walker, Dracula. Tom Lithrop, Creature. Jeffrey Lee, Dracula, hands down. Josh Hayes, Frankenstein. Daniel... Roebuck LaFleur, Visible Man, Avery McReynolds, Creature from the Black Lagoon, James Higgins, Frankenstein Hands Down, Richard Calvero, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Matt Al, I'm going to go with Phantom of the Opera on this one, Dave. And then we have Nick Mua, favorite universal uh, creature feature, Why the Mummy, of course, the perfect mix of drama and scares. I dare say it still holds up and Boris Karloff's acting out of this world and into the next. Questions. If you could have a drink with any universal monster, which would you pick? Ooh, that's a tough one. Who would kill me least? If I could have a drink with any. Don't want Dracula is going to kill you. You're going to get hit by the bride, so you never get out of there. He's also evil. The other ones are just misunderstood. I guess I would go, no, I don't want to be with a... I, I don't... No, Wolfman's killing you. Creature's killing you. Mommy's killing you. are all going to get killed. I think that maybe I would have to pick... Um, the Phantom of the Opera. I think I could survive the Phantom of the Opera. Or a Hunchback of Notre Dame. I go Hunchback. If he counts as Universal, I'm going to go Hunchback. If not, I'll go Phantom. Um, so we'll use, I mean, like as far as one, I would, I like, you know, I, I'm picking by safety. Will you splurge on black Friday and buy more movies than you can carry? Might possibly, but their sales are going all month. So it'll be spread out when making a movie, which is better too much money or too little. I mean, you always want more money, right? I've never had a lot of money to make a movie. Um, but honestly though, they always say with all the money comes like the people coming in to interfere. Honestly, I don't know. I'm not that experienced in making movies and I don't want to be sitting here from some like a uh, uh, point where I don't have any point of reference and be like, well, I'll tell you what's better. I've never had a lot of money to make movies. I've only made movies for dirt cheap where I had all control. So I just know that sometimes it sucks not to have any money because, but you basically do what you can do. Love the second eighties tear on track episode, sir. Eventually you and your co-host will belt out an eighties classic song, right? Maybe maybe so i think we're gonna hop into the update and the patreon drawing and uh 
yeah, we'll come back. Oh, before I get out of here, I want to do a Patreon shout out to L. Calamar. Thank you very much for your support. If you need anything, shoot me a message. Um, yeah, so we're going to hop into that update and the drawings. Okay, a fairly quick update here. First up, we have the 4K of Reservoir Dogs. Absolute classic. Hope it looks great. I love this movie. It's still one of my favorite Tarantino movies. I don't know if it's the best. These movies I've watched for so long. Love the cast. It's just one of my favorites. I mean, come on. Harvey Keitel is in there. I love Harvey Keitel and Chris Penn, Lawrence Sterney, Michael Madsen. God, you can't beat it, right? Very quotable. And then we have uh, Quiet Place 2. I've never seen part 1 or 2, but it was dirt cheap. And I was like, well, I'll pick these up. These seem like good movies to watch over, you know, the Christmas break that I'm going to have. You know, just fun monster movies, I guess. Pretty cool, I guess. I hear good things. And we have this on Blu-ray, the Sonny Chiba collection from Screen Factory. I really couldn't pass this up. I really wanted it. I had a bunch of movies I had heard of. I was like, this sounds totally up my alley. Um, so it's got a slew. It's got more movies than I expected. Seven of his best films. Very cool. We have, what do we have here? Yakuza Wolf 1, Yakuza Wolf 2, Bodyguard Kiba 1 and 2, Shogun Shadow, Samurai Resurrection, uh, Reincarnation, and Sword of Vengeance. It's got a slew of movies, man. For the price, it was 50 bucks. You get seven movies, you know? I, got, I dig that, right? Some special features on there. And last, but certainly not least, we got... Mia Goth in Pearl. Heard a lot of great things. My my boy Dave Z and uh, Christian from Exploding Heads, they love this, so they gave it a glowing review. I'm going to watch this in X ASAP. I'm sure I'll enjoy both. I've not heard really any real bad things, and if I did hear bad things, they weren't they weren't like incredibly negative, you know. It was like, not for me, so stuff like that. So anyways, let's uh, hop back to the video. Oh, let's do this drawing, too. Might as well do the drawing. Where's those pieces of paper? So we're going to draw five names out for the Patreon picks. Here we go and see what I will be watching. Uh, I just feel like throwing them out. One, two, three. We'll do them all together. Four, five. And and if I you haven't been drawn out in a long time and over the last three or four drawings, shoot me a message. I feel like I did forget somebody, so shoot me a message and let me know. I, that happens sometimes. You can skip the line. Um, Chris Rivers. Hey, Dave. Just sending my September pick. How about my man, Godfrey? There we go. I guess I should have cut that down, right? I don't know what's wrong with me. What do we got here? Um, Dan the Cameraman. Pick pick from Jeremy. So he's letting Jeremy do my pick. Okay. Um, what else do we have here? Jim Simons. Uh, lipstick. Uh, it's been a long time since I watched Lipstick. It's 1976. Chris Sarandon. Good movie. Oh, we got uh, Tristan Collier, Duke of Burgundy, which is, uh, what's that director's name? I can't think of. Oh, geez, he did um, the In Fabric movie, which is really crazy. And last is Tom Brooker, Run, which is a Hulu movie, I believe. So that's the picks. Uh, we're going to hop back to the video. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Me.